Okay. Thank you. Say it again. Thank you. Okay, so I, like I was introduced as a technologist, I, I'm going to explain a little bit about technology, about this robot autonomy, and uh, the talk is going to be a little bit ambitious in terms of all the things I plan on saying, but I, um, some are deeper technology and I will will go on as, as we go. Anyway, so uh, this talk is about like telling you a little bit about robot autonomy. So I've been in this business of trying to pursue a quest for autonomy in terms of the integration of machines that can do perception, which means that they have sensors that enable them to, them to understand the world. They also have cognition because they try to select actions and plan and actually learn to achieve goals and they move. So it's this combination that enables us to do things throughout the the, the history that, for example, led these robots to be able to play soccer. And I want to tell you one thing, uh, though they look cute, right? So we all like, ignore the cuteness for a second and just think about that they are actually computers, computers with legs and a camera and they actually talk with each other. So what's remarkable about this is that they are running their, their programs and ignore this one that goes to the ball, that's the easiest part, but this one here is the real smart, intelligent guy that sees the ball, does not go to the ball because it's the role of this one, uh, continues planning its route to be an assistant attacker, so it's only assisting, and it keeps positioning itself, always like negotiating with that, up to the point that eventually, when it comes for the, its turn to take the role, it's capable of scoring. <laughs> so, this is remarkable, even I have been doing this for many years. Why is this so remarkable from my point of view? It's because this is a computer program running. There is no one joysticking these robots. There is no one uh, telling them anything. We have never seen this particular situation, the ball against the wall, the, 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 the actual defender there, the goalie. We have never seen this thing in the lab because this was a game against some other team, I forget which. But the interesting thing is that the computer program can handle this. Uh, can solve by itself this situation, which happens to be just playing soccer, but it's quite a challenging situation from an uncertainty point of view. And of course, we also have done like other, it's called leagues in this RoboCup, which involve these small robots moving around, and there is like a very interesting pass, and then they pass again, and pass again, and then pass across the field, that one misses the pass, which is robotics at its best, and then it scores. So I'll show one more time, because this is too fast, but it's a very beautiful concept of coordination. You pass to this one, pass again, this one shoots, misses the shot, and eventually the goal goes on, and that one also misses the pass, and eventually it scores. So this is again a computer program running this, and then computer programs also, AI systems in autonomy, also move these creatures, like a Baxter, it's called this robot, and this robot is doing nothing else than just sorting these objects on the table according to color. The red things go to one side, the yellow things go to the other side, doesn't matter. All about autonomy, they have to see, they have to plan their actions and they execute them from the little Ivo, Sony Ivo robots, the small size, this Baxter, and then these robots that at CMU have been moving around for a while, which are these cobot robots. And these cobot robots are service robots, and that's what we'll delve into this talk, is me explaining you what this is all about within this framework. So these robots move in the building. They, are, uh, they have done, we, we have been doing this for several years now, and several PhD theses in different aspects of this problem. Again, it's a complicated problem, have been uh, developed at CMU, and I'll explain this. So the outline of my talk has two parts. First, I'll try to explain, focus on the cobot robots, how they are actually autonomous. How do they move? How do they localize? How do they actually know where they are? And then I'll enter how do they interact with the humans, and I'll focus that on the second part. So let me just explain to you what's going on. So when these robots move around in the building, they have these 
a fantastic, challenging problem of stopping at the right place. They are going to, supposed to go to a particular office, and they stop at the right place, this go-to location. <laughs> Even if it doesn't look as cool, uh, stopping at the right place is as big an accomplishment, is bigger or uh, yeah, big and bigger accomplishment than scoring a goal. This is more difficult in a building with 350 offices in which this machine goes by itself everywhere to stop at the right place. <laughs> so we are going to spend about like two or three minutes understanding how does this happen. And so you understand what the technology is all about. Okay, first of all, there is all this concept of uh, setting up tasks. Who tells these machines where they are supposed to go? So in <coughs> fact, we have all this AI infrastructure uh, knowledge infrastructure on top of the actual hardware platform that requests things from the robot. So when I actually want a visitor to come to my office, I go to a web page and I say at 3 p.m. come to my office, uh, escort some visitor from the elevator to my office. So there is this all these these uh, setup of having to do this knowledge part of the request, and that actually set up and uh, talks with some scheduler, and the scheduler sees all the requests, uh, comes up with a, a list of tasks for all the robots. We have four of them, uh, uh, no, actually now three. One of them went to UMass Amherst for, with my student, Joy Deep Bisvaz, when he finished. I very generously sent one with him. But the scheduler eventually then assigns tasks, and the robot moves. So, for example, here is an example of the robot escorting Eric Horvitz, who is a, rep a, report, uh, a researcher at Microsoft Research, to my office. It's the only video I have of one of my visitors being escorted by a robot because Eric very kindly took this video as he was moving down to my office. Uh, you'll see I'm at the end of the corridor. And Eric is recording its experience, but more than... 300 or 200 or 400 visitors have come to my office escorted by the robot. I never send directions where my office is. The robot meets the person at the, the elevator and then just say, follow me, and it takes them down these corridors at Carnegie Mellon to my office. I'm actually at the end of that corridor over there, but I want you to appreciate also from a technical point of view the different scenarios. They pass through chairs, they are people, they have doors open, door closed, they have a big light at the end. This corridor is, has always been a challenge from a sensing point of view because of the bright light uh, at that end of that glass wall, and Eric is very happy, and there I am in my office, and eventually the robot, when it gets there, tells the visitor, yeah, here you are, you know, came to my office, and so forth. So how does this happen? So now we are going to delve a little bit into this localization problem. So these machines, like I told you, have the ability to perceive, uh, think, and act. So perception in a robot is done through some sensors, and you can have cameras, you can have all sorts of sensors. Here, this robot has a laser, and I'll explain what this is, and has a connect, which I'll also explain what it is. And then the computation is on that la laptop. It could be a separate unit, like some computation uh, computer that you buy with like the IBOs. You don't see a keyboard on the IBOs. You could have done some kind of other computation. We just use the laptop. And then they have wheels. Uh, this robot has wheels, and I'm not going to tell you a lot about the mechanics, but you have to appreciate one thing. These wheels are what we call omnidirectional because they actually can move the robot in any direction, sideways, backwards, to all the directions, so the robot have a very smooth, smooth motion. These wheels are the same that the little soccer robots have, now in a bigger scale, and the little wheeled ones. And they were built, these robots were built by a, a genius, a fantastic researcher and engineer, Mike Lasitra, who is now at Google, and if you ever meet Mike LaCitra, you should tell him congratulations. It's a major accomplishment that these machines have moved at CMU, basically without almost any maintenance, and they are for years and years, and this is tribute to the hardware itself. So when uh, uh, president was saying, the president was saying about where's the robot, there is this problem of actually the hardware the hardware, not just the AI part. So we need to have credit, give credit to the hardware design. Uh, they don't look that fascinating, these robots, but they function really well. 
So maybe some of the, this, this, uh, we always think about just the, the cognitive aspect, do they know, the knowledge, but the hardware. We are an amazing hardware, ourselves. And getting to the point that we have this hardware is a big step forward. So let me just explain what these sensors are all about. So this LADAR basically is a machine that is able to scan distance to obstacles at a particular level, only one in 2D, kind of like one scan. And what it returns, and this is very important for you to see, and I, it's, uh, uh, it returns basically to the computer lines, these two lines that say the distance that we, this wall is, the distance that that wall is, and basically nothing in the front. So they don't see anything about walls, nothing. They just return two lines, which is where the obstacles are. And eventually the, the depth camera gets you a 3D view of the, of, the, 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 of the space in front of it with a particular angle, not 270 degrees like the laser, but just 60 degrees. But it takes everything around and provides a big point cloud of obstacles. And this is the representation that just for visualization purposes, it's a huge kind of like data structure with every single point tells at which distance the obstacles are, okay? So the challenge from an AI point of view is now taking the input from these sensors, these two kind of like weird kind of like sensors that only tell you distance to obstacles, just distance, numbers, 122, 135, minus blah, the only numbers and convert these to knowledge. So to things that you can reason about. So here is an image. The robot has a map, it could have learned it. It doesn't really matter where the map comes from. Assume the map exists. And then eventually you have to do wall detection. So this cobot does not do anything else than wall detection. Where are the walls so that you know the width of the corridor, you know if you got to the end of the corridor, you know if you go through doors. So it's only detecting walls to detect where it is. So I'm going to go through a very fast, the algorithm of detecting these walls because from a computer science point of view, an AI point of view, it's a challenge to make robots move in real time because of the computation that's needed for these sensors. So it's not about like having the robot at night look at the image and figure out what the walls are. The robot moves with a person, and as it moves, it needs to do it efficiently. So I mentioned the hardware problem, which is underlying a lot of robotics, and now I mentioned to you the real-time problem. How do we get the robots to actually do this while they move? That gigantic point cloud is really enormous in terms of computation. So we had to invent, with Joydeep Biswas, a, a, a new technique to process that gigantic amount of data in real time. And the technique we use is really beautiful and simple. It's based on sampling. So what happens is like this. The algorithm does the following. When it gets all these points from the, that connect, from that camera, that sensor, that feeds into a computer program a gigantic amount of data, it takes three points on this image, and three points, you compute a normal, and the normal defines a plane. So those three points are on a plane. And then it does this, repeat, uh, repeats it, and while the points are all with the same normal, it decides that they are all in the same plane. And here is an example of this algorithm running on a depth image that finds the planar surfaces in the image and knows where are the planar surfaces with respect to the robot in this image. And these is our planar surfaces of a particular size so here is like a, the top of the desk being detected and eventually the monitor being detected. You see them here. And these little kind of like things that you see is a visualization of this computation of the normals on that image. So even if, it's a, if, even if it may look to you very technical, it doesn't matter. It's for you just to understand that for AI to process enormous amounts of information and in particular robots in real time, we have to have interesting ideas from a, an algorithm point of view. We cannot just take all the information and still move in real time. And here is the robot, and here is a very interesting representation. I want you to understand that this is a visualization of the robot, and these little kind of orange circles 
is the uncertainty of where the robot thinks that it is in that space. It does not know really if it's to, uh, slightly to the left, slightly to the right. It thinks it's a little bit kind of like somewhere here. And, as, and I always never say, but maybe I should clarify that indoors, when we have spaces where inside of buildings, we do not have GPS for a robot to know where it's its latitude and longitude inside of the building. We don't have that. So these mechanisms are mechanisms of localization indoors, where we really have to use maps to find where we are. And so the robot, this is the raw image of the robot. This is like what I just showed you in the other scene in which the robot is computing these normals. Let me also clarify that the reason why these have different colors is only a visualization. So orange is close and green is far. If I don't put these colors, you don't have the feeling of depth by just looking at this visualization. So that's what it is. And eventually the robot comes here, and this is all glass, cannot see, and eventually it starts seeing a little bit of, look at that, over there it sees a little bit of the wall, which is this thing here on the wall, a plane shows up on the left at some distance, and the robot is now more convinced that it is at this point in the map, and when it sees this corner, the uncertainty completely reduces, the robot knows exactly where it is because it saw that corner at two meters and that wall as 1.5 meters. So according to my map, I'm right here. So it knows where it is and continues like that. So that cobot, when it moves in the building, it's basically moving um, to uh, computing this distance to walls, just looks at walls and is able to move in these environments. Very challenging, like wooden floors and you know large hallways and then corridors on the left and plants and glass and all sorts of things. And this is the robot moving at CMU as it moves by itself. Nobody follows this robot. In fact, I don't have almost, uh, I'm, we have very little footage because we have to follow it to take video footage. But here is a proof that is very well localized. On this transition from wood to carpet, we told the robot in the map to slow down. Look at it as it slows down exactly over that bump because the map, in its knowledge, says that at that moment it should go much slower. And there is nothing that is seeing the bump, but there is a detector of localization that tells exactly where it is and eventually knows. Do you understand? So this is really, Annika, that's Joy Deep there. This is really interesting, but then there was more to life than really having just a robot be able to localize well. The problem is that environments at CMU and everywhere have many things that vary. The position of the chairs, the position of the tables, they are varying environments. And from a robot point of view, that's really hard to handle because you can learn the map today with these particular kind of positions, but tomorrow they are in a different position and they are all confused by this. So therefore, Joy Deep invented this algorithm that is able to separate the observation, these obstacles, into things that match long-term features like walls that don't change, to, and things that are short-term like tables and chairs, and the people, which are the dynamic features, which are ignored. So I don't have, uh, this is my most technical slide, but I don't have uh, great hopes for you to understand this, but I want you to understand one thing. Let me try to explain here something. The way that we, these robots function with all these things that they see, it's what we call the Markovian way. Markovian in the sense that they only like uh, to compute some state, like uh, where you are at time i plus one, they only use the previous state not the history of everything that they've seen since they left the lab. They only use the previous state, and they use their control, which is, is you, how much you are moving your motors, and you, you use what you see now. And this had been classical localization of all robots that move indoors uh, for many years, for 20 years. Now, because we actually are in these varying environments, nobody had solved this problem, and Joy Deep introduced this concept of non-Markov localization, in which the chairs and the tables and everything that's labeled as short-term does not match the map, the static map, is used in a non-Markovian way. So what matters is that the robot now actually looks at the position of the chair now, moves one meter forward, looks at the position of that chair, 
and eventually by comparing its vision, its sensing of the chair, knows really well what it is by using an episode of observations. So it's capable of doing a non-Markovian local analysis versus this forgetting about the past. Anyway, that enables the robot to actually move in any environment, and this is the robot at NYU, where I was on sabbatical 2013-2014, and my students were with me. We brought the robot, and in a couple of days, by checking the PDF, the floor plans of this building, and giving them to the robot, the robot navigated at NYU hundreds of kilometers without any problem, even like all these cubicles were not part of the map, but it uses them in a non-Markovian way, and it beautifully moved in the building everywhere and st uh, knowing its position. Let me just add one more thing, because I sometimes take this for granted that uh, uh, I, we, I mean, I've been used so much to this. This stopping here is really not stopping at a semantic location. It's an X, Y location. So this is a map. And this is like uh, every single point has coordinates, like longitudes and, uh, uh, and latitudes, they are coordinates, and we send the robot to particular coordinates on the map, and the robot detects that it's there. Before I delve into the, 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 the part with the humans, let me just tell you something that's really beautiful for people that were w are wondering what can robots do besides transporting things from place to place or guiding, uh, escorting visitors to Manuela's office or to anywhere, what they can do. What happens here is that these robots, while they move, if you equip these robots with sensors, like a Wi-Fi kind of like a, a signal detector of the strength, these robots are data collectors. They are data collectors. As they know exactly where they are on the building in coordinates, they can assign the value of any kind of like a, a vital of the building that they collect and assign them to these maps. So when we see a robot move around, and in fact, I entered Rice University, I entered the hotel next door, and there were no robots moving anywhere, which is uh, disappointing, uh, to tell the least. Uh, to tell the least, people I know that at the end of this conference, everybody will say, oh, robots are horrible. I, I think they are not. So, uh, and I think we have to get used to this kind of concept that robots will be here. We just don't know when, but they will be. Uh, that, in fact, they are data collectors. They are able to do something that humans can't do. I, myself, even if you tell me that this building, uh, the coordinates, the zero, zero is at that column, I don't know. We don't have a good localization sensor. I don't know exactly where I am. I can estimate, oh, okay, maybe like 15 meters, but I don't know my coordinates. The robots do. And they can assign value of some vital temperature, humidity, noise level, illumination, Wi-Fi signal, and provide these very, very accurate maps of these vitals of the building. And here is an example of a map created at NYU, actually, I believe this was, of the temperature of the building. As the robot moved around, it collected the temperature of the building at different times of the day and produced hundreds of these maps, which humans later could use for whatever decisions they want to make, where to put better thermostats, where to put access points, what to do about the noise level, anything. But it's very beautiful also to think that these mobile robots be it the autonomous cars outdoors that will eventually drive you from place to a place, or these robots indoors, as they move, they can collect a lot of information that may be of use to make decisions. And they also can do active learning. Some people say, oh, they only go to where you tell them to go. That's not right. They actually, based on the data that they have, they can actively decide that they will go through these routes, so they will collect more data that they are missing in their model. So there is a whole research on this problem of active learning of a model of whatever quantity you are trying to collect through motion. Because of these, the robots were able and are still moving at CMU, and this is what I'll del delve into later uh, now, uh, for kilometers. They go and go and go, and they have traversed all our buildings, 350 uh, flo uh, offices, nine floors in the building, plus the building next to ours, plus the building at NYU. Anything that's connected through a bridge, uh, an indoor bridge, they don't go outdoors. Uh, the reason why they don't go outdoors is a hardware thing. They have a very low clearance, so they even on tile, they bump too much. 
uh, even that bump, uh, you know, you can disconnect. So they are not really robots to go uh, in the rough terrain outdoors. And so that's why they don't go outdoors, but uh, my student actually, Joy Deep, who is a professor at uh, UMass, is now working on a robot that will go indoors, outdoors, and traverse the whole uh, space. Ours don't, from a hardware point of view, and also sensing point of view. So now we are done with this first part, and um, I'm uh, halfway through uh, my time, and I'll now delve into this peer interaction with humans. So let me, t let me la explain to you something. These robots, Robots do not have arms. Did you notice that they don't have arms? They don't have anything. So they cannot manipulate objects. So when I tell they take things from one place to another, how do they pick up things? They do not. So they actually have a basket, which is better than arms, but that's okay. And, and uh, they cannot pick up things, and they cannot also not press elevator buttons. They cannot open doors. They have all these kind of intrinsic kind of limitations. And even if they would be able to have arms, do you think that they will be able to open all the doors of the world? Maybe not yet. See what I'm saying? So think about this. So what we came up with this is that we invented this concept of robots asking for help. So the robots are autonomous. They have inevitably limitations. And when they don't know, or when they can't do, or when they need to find out more, they ask explicit for help. So here is the robot at CMU, how it actually takes the elevator. So these robots basically get to the elevator hall, if they have to go to a different floor, and they basically say, can you please push the up button and hold the elevator door? And some generous human, uh, here it's uh, Stephanie Rosenthal, who did a thesis on this problem of human-centered planning, tells, yeah, says, yeah. And then the robot asks, which elevator is going up? And uh, it, she looks, and it's the right one. And look, the robot goes in by itself. Remarkable. But it asked for help on pressing the elevator button and on actually holding the door. And then when the robot is inside, the robot happily says, can you please press 8 and tell me when we get to that floor? <laughs> and eventually the human generously tells when to get to the elevator to the right floor, and the robot goes, and I'm on my own. So now, when you see the robot at CMU, you know that it can't do everything by itself. But it's fine, because this is also my, my way of solving problems in life. According to, uh, you know, the way that you could solve this would have been, okay, let's buy better sensors, let's wait till we have an arm, let's make sure that the robot knows, sees, everything. And we could. We spend thousands of dollars more, and the robot will become more proficient. But I all, now I believe that no matter what, they will still always have limitations. <laughs> so the question becomes now from a philosophical point of view and from a discussion point of view, I'll come to this at the end, that in fact they are about <coughs> complementing humans and not just doing the same thing as humans. So they will be able to do something. Some, so some of you might ask, what if nobody helps? What if they send the right thing? What if? Guess what? They send us email. Uh, and so if they are, they send us email. I've waited for more than five minutes for a response to the question, blah, blah. Nobody come. Can some come? So when you are blocked, also, I've been blocked for more than three minutes. Can someone come to this and rescue me? So which means is that this robot will never get stuck. Because ultimately, if you interfere with its asking for help thing, it just sends us email. And in fact, at CMU, if you tell the robot to get out on floor eight and it's on floor four or whatever, it detects it's on the wrong floor, turns around again and says, I want to go to eight, blah, blah. If it keeps, someone would keep the robot there on the elevator, up and down, up and down, and it would send us email. Thresholds, after five minutes of being stuck up and down, it sends us email. And thank goodness, my students, myself, it's almost there is this pool of people that will definitely, with probability one, help me. Let me go to that pool of people if the random people around me don't help me. That's fine. I have that guarantee that Manuela, even if she were giving a talk or in a class and she would get this, she would come and help me. And there, there's this, this assumption that there is that probability one helper somewhere. And that's really beautiful because we have these robots autonomous, so they are free to be autonomous because there is always someone who will help them. In a, it can take more. 
Now, it's true that if by any chance nobody helps, he, uh, this robot stops if it's not on the right floor or just goes to the lab and that's it. Sends email to the person to which you were, I'm not going, that's it, I can't do it, fine. But see what I'm saying, this is very important. Now, this is for the actuation part and for the motion, but you also can query this robot and here is how it handles it. So here it is. Please, please bring a coffee to the lab. And this is this Thomas Collar. This object is not. I don't know what coffee is. is and I'm going to ask the web. Office, room, or room. Where is this object? object this thing from, from, from the web says that coffee, object, copy and location, kitchen, kitchen. Kitchen. Okay. I will collect the object, copy, and deliver it at the lab, room 7412. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And now the robot is all happy because it has everything. You know, it knows the object that's at the kitchen. It knows that it needs to go to the lab, and it's done. It doesn't need to ask more questions. It just goes. Now I can ask you, what happens at the kitchen? How does this robot get coffee? How does the robot get coffee? Ask for help. There you go. No problem, because this robot is, doesn't mind. It just gets there to the kitchen. Location perfect. Hello. Hello. Please Could you please put the object in coffee my in my basket? And again, go. you can send, press ready when I'm ready to go. And there's Mehdi Samadi who did all these object you, evolve. Thank you. And I'm thank you. And there you go. And this robot goes. And what would have happened if there were no one in the kitchen that would put coffee? It would say a few times, can you please put coffee in my bathroom? Nothing happened. Sends me email. I'm here in the kitchen waiting for someone to put coffee in my basket. Nobody's here. I'm supposed to get this coffee down to the lab. Do you understand? So, but that's like now, the question here is like help for putting this, but coffee did not know. And this robot actually now has a learning opportunity because when you help the robot by pressing a button on the elevator, the robot does not learn to press the elevator because it doesn't have actuators. But here, it went to the web to find out where coffee was and it can learn and it accumulates, this is just a printout of the actual file down there. It says object grounds to coffee, 7602 and 2.32, which are weight probabilistic and something that tells, wow, I have confidence of this much on this information. So next time, and it also knew about lab, there you go, 7412 comes from this. So humans can talk with this robot. The robot asks what you mean. As soon as you reveal what you mean, it saves it. It saves it. So now you can go to CMU and say, you know, go to Manuela's office, and in its map there is nothing called Manuela's office, and there are only points, coordinates called 7002, 7002, kind of things it knows in the map, and we bridge the gap between what the robot knows, which is that map with some kind of labeled locations, and the language the humans use by learning the mapping. We call that the grounding. And at the beginning, you can say, oh, okay, Manuel, but why didn't you start the robot with where people are in the building, which is a directory which every, build, every kind of building has? We could have, but it doesn't matter because people then ask about bring me chocolate or take this book to the lab. They keep like referencing things that the robot does not know what it means, but it asks. And when it asks, saves. So this robot has learned thousands of things just by being on the wild. We don't even know <laughs> what it knows. We just know because it talks with other people. But now if you tell the robot, get me coffee tomorrow, it will immediately offer, do you mean, do you want me to get it from a kitchen? Immediately, because that experience is there. And then the Bayesian's update and the probabilistic counting eventually gets the robot to know more and more about its world. So it, I just want you to understand, there is the hardware problem, there is the sensing problem, there is the tasking problem, there is this kind of like I can do it all asking for help. And then there is this learning problem, this learning opportunity. The robots don't need to know everything up front. Of course, they don't grow arms because I taught, but they learn all these things, and you are about to save them. So this is the, the, the part about learning, beautiful concept that you just have to release this robot. You don't have to worry about telling it all, because humans, by using the robot, 
enable the robot to know a lot of stuff. Because we actually say, we reveal ourselves when we talk with this machine. So now I'm going to talk about the last topic, which is very dear to my heart, and also I believe a very relevance to this concept of, of, of uh, robots being uh, perceived as, um, as uh, something that coexists with humans. So I call this transparency. And let me explain what this is all about. So, you know, I have, like I told you, I've been in this uh, research of doing autonomous creatures forever. And what happens is the following. Autonomy, it's a very kind of disturbing concept because autonomy means that I'm not controlling the thing and the thing is doing things by itself. So when you look at the robot soccer game, you would like to know what happened. And here is an explanation that we generated. Like the robot here, at this moment, at this moment, we are looking at the video and the planner already knows that it's going to pass the ball over there. So we can actually show that and eventually you are going to see the ball is actually passed there. And again, the planner, the algorithm knows that it's going to pass there and eventually it goes. So there is this issue about having the, uh, so autonomy, my autonomy, you don't know, you cannot come to my brain and check out what I'm thinking. But the computers, you can. These things are planning future moves which are visible. So for example, here in, a, in a, the, the drone flying, this is all what's happening. If you see the drone flying, look, the thesis of my student, Danny Tsu, is about overlaying onto a real video all the thinking that's going on. So this is automatically generated, the route that the robot is planning on taking, the points that's computing, it doesn't matter, but what matters is that now, in terms of research, we are working on this problem of having the computer program, all those lines of code, on top of the actual actuation, reveal more about what's happening in terms of planning. And so here is an example also in the small size in the, the robot that shows exactly how that work, that play that we saw earlier, we slowed it down so we understand. So here it is, the planner is computing, the ball is over there, and the planner is computing to which robot should I pass. And it's one, two, three, four, decides to pass on that one, and eventually, uh, there you go, and you now are going to follow the whole scene by knowing what was going on. It passes again. Now the planner is planning on passing there. It passes there. And again, this autonomous thinking is planning on going there. It passes there. And now this one computes whether there is an open angle, decides so. This one predicts a common field that predicts the ball is going there. There's the ball. And then eventually this thing here goes and passes to that one there. And this one misses the pass, there you go, but was computing that it could shoot directly and eventually misses, goes back and considers, do I pass or do I shoot? See that it has an opening at the uh, and it shoots. Do you understand how beautiful this is now? Now you look at this. If I know you show you now videos of robot soccer, all automatically annotated, maybe you know much more about what's going on rather than just saying, why did they pass? Why did they shoot? Why did they miss? You now have more because it's a million lines of codes or thousands of lines of codes that we can actually extract this visualization of the reasoning, okay? So for Cobot, it's actually very important to do this because you cannot imagine the, the feeling of having this robot stop in front of my door and you wonder, what are you going to do next? What is your internal state? Where, what path did you, which path did you take? What happened by the elevator? How long did it take to arrive here? Did you successfully escort uh, Eric? How, why are you late? You cannot ask anything to this robot. It does escort people perfectly. I could go and write down code to, in, my, in Python to extract answers for all of this, but we were wondering for regular users, if you cannot ask anything in language to these machines, how can you coexist with them? 
So now it became a question of how do we find out more about these machines? So the first thing we did was to actually uh, uh, increase the, 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 the explanations that the robot do through expressive lights. So the robots, when they are blocked, it actually they have this red light that blinks. And the person understands that there is something wrong with the robot. Not just saying, please excuse me, it also blinks this light. And so also, when it's waiting for help, it has this blue, light, this blue light. And when it wants to turn left and right, it shows the lights on its LEDs. And this is the thesis of my student, Kim Baraka. And then there is also something very beautiful. When someone is escorted to my office, you have no clue how far my office is. It could be that you are up to follow this robot for kilometers, or that you are up to follow the robot for two meters. You don't know. And that was always like, you, visitors were always like, oh my god, where am I going? Where, does this thing know where it's going? You know, it's kind of like, this is what I'm telling you. It's kind of an experience. So come to Carnegie Mellon and visit me. I'm telling you, it's true. It's true. It's an experience for anyone who comes to follow this thing. This thing, which is not a human, and just you trust this thing and you follow this thing through. That's it. But now we actually have this progress bar, a light, that starts by being all blue, and as the robot approaches my office, it becomes more and more green. And magically, the humans know how far they are from my office because the thing is like a progress bar, like when we are downloading something, exactly the same concept in the robot. Really amazing about, how do you say, making what the robot always, always knew more transparent to humans, so humans understand more what's happening. And then finally, what we have been working on is also these, uh, finally means in this, oops. Uh, we are, I'm sorry. We are working on this problem of actually explaining this thing. Which route did you come from? Because you have to understand something that uh, I don't know how to tell you. So how many people have a Roomba? If you don't have a Roomba, the room, there you go. If you don't have a Roomba, homework number one today is buy a Roomba for Christmas. It's a perfect, perfect time to buy a Roomba. A Roomba is this kind of like a vacuum cleaner robot that moves by itself. And you need to enable your children, your grandchildren, yourself to experience something that moves by itself. Given that we don't have yet, like the autonomous cars, we don't have cobots everywhere, people have to get used of things that move. My cell phone doesn't move, my computer doesn't move. They are all refrigerators one way or another. So we need to go beyond the static technology and have robots, have things that move. So what happens is like this, when the cobot is in my office, in front of my office, down the corridor, I still see the robot. When it turns, I still hear the robot. After some time, I don't see and I don't hear. Here, it's gone. So you don't know anything about this robot when you see it in front of your office. So it does have a route. And so what we did was that even a route that left from the, some third floor, takes some elevator, this is the robot moving, get to the second floor, we int introduced this concept of verbalization. So now, all that geometric experience, going from position to position, route planning and so forth, is spoken out by the robot automatically. So the robot, instead of visualizing, verbalizes experience and is able to describe what he has done. I started from room 3201, I went through 3200, and this for us, it's really beautiful to be able to have the robot tell us, tell us in English. It's not very fancy, it's like da-da-da sequence. It's not Shakespeare, but it's like telling us what he did. And uh, we did that by actually annotating the map, the map has annotations with office that enable it to, me to mention elevators and kitchens. These are locations that became labeled. This is what the robot knows. 1607 is the core, minus 43 is the coordinate of that point. And this is like an angle in radiance. And this is what humans understand. Office, bathroom, stair, elevator. So look how beautiful, this is like mapping whoops, up, down there, whatever it's doing, to things that the humans can do. And then we also understood something, which is that this verbalization thing is not about one explanation, it's about multiple levels. So there is a verbalization space. You can be more abstract, you can be more specific, you can be more local, 
And therefore, we introduce this concept of different levels of explanation. There is not one single explanation. So the same experience, you can just say, I traveled 26 meters and took 152 seconds on the seventh floor, done. It can give the detailed explanation, or it can give some other version. So it depends where you are in this verbalization space, and you may want different types of explanation. So this, this is not about being, be, being, so when you interact with humans, being about like one explanation. So then we did some learning of language to explanation, which is very beautiful. So if the robot gives you an explanation and the human says, oh, tell me exactly how you got here, that language. If you say to Cobot, tell me exactly. So Cobot generates an explanation in this verbalization space, which is the more detailed, the more specific, the more uh, abstract. It's like, oh, oops, it goes that way. But then if the human says, OK, no, only tell me, is it me? No. <laughs> Only tell me what happened near the room 7004, the robot goes to another point in that verbalization space, which is only there. And then if you say, can you give me a brief summary, it goes to another point in the verbalization space. So now, verbalizations became motion of the robot in that explanation space and we learn the mapping between language. If you say, tell me exactly what happened by the kitchen, exactly means go down in terms of detail and just go to that particular point. So it's amazing, this ability to be able to actually have these robots uh, uh, talk with humans. And so in conclusion, this is what I told you. I could have told you other things, but I really think that it's very important to understand that this transparency is very connected with the ability that humans will have to trust these machines, to coexist with them. And unless we invest in parallel on functionality, which is the ability for machines to be smart, and on explanation or the ability to be able to be uh, transparent, uh, accountable, to be able to be corrected. We have like research on that humans correct what they were supposed, all through language. We are going to have a hard time having these machines that come here, take the world, take over the world, and we don't even know, we cannot even talk with them. We don't even know what they are doing because they function in the, num in the world of numbers, in the world of thresholds, and we function in the world of language. So I really think that is fundamental, and I believe uh, this is the beginning I have a lot of like research on this explanation generation on making these machines more transparent. And I want to finish with one video, which I hope does not drive all the questions, but I want you to understand one thing, and also, is that you saw the robot soccer, you saw how beautiful they do, but they were not always like this. This is RoboCop in 97. I mean, look at how they moved, look at them, like this is what they did. <laughs> This is 98, this is 98 too. We won, we were champions in 98. But look at them, look at here, look at this. This is like, the robots look at them, have to go through this, the goalie hardly moves. And so what I want to, why do I show this? And actually, I, I always, now I always show you this, to understand that AI is not a one-shot deal. It's not a one-shot deal. This is something that we get engaged and gets better and better. The, RoboCop so, the, the ro robot soccer players now be do make beautiful passes, but that's how they started. And who knows what they will be 10 years from now. So a lot of our research has to be about setting up these milestones, this road kind of, this road map, and not about assuming, yeah, the, ro the robots will come here and give a talk and understand everything we say. No, no, no. Well, let's first let's make sure that they can reach here, and then eventually that they can understand, and who knows. So. I think that for the discussion throughout the day, jobs, com competence, uh, tasks, and all of this, this is an incremental process. This is not something that magically we give birth to a robot and ba basically the robot knows how to do it all. No. And this is like, a, so in your mind, keep this story of what I told you and do not forget this video because it tells you that that's how it is. And now you saw a cobot that can do this. Tomorrow, cobot will be able to say why it is late. It will be able to offer proactively things. Oh, Manuela, there's a lot of people at the kitchen. Itself will know what are events to report. And it will become better and better and better as time goes. OK, thank you very much, and I'll take questions.
Humphrey Bogart, this is the beginning of a wonderful relationship. Exactly. <laughs> we have time for one question. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I found most profound about what you were talking about is when you mentioned the limitations yes. of the cobots. And I wonder if you've thought about how recognizing the limitations of the robots may help us in dealing with human limitations. Um, I was thinking about universal design, for instance, and the way that you were talking about using and designing buildings and wondering if that might allow us to make some real leaps forward in terms of how we deal with people, you know, just the range of human difference, and maybe coming to terms with that in a way that we've been struggling with. Uh, it's a very good question, and indeed, I think that uh, uh, this is my acknowledgement also as a person, as a human, not as a scientist, that the world is full of differences, and humans themselves uh, have differences. I speak with this accent, but I also speak five languages, and I play squash, maybe not as well as you do, and I don't run as well as other people do, or whatever. So I don't have, uh, how do you say, equal abilities to everybody else, and I don't tell that someone who has uh, some difference than me is less human. So we acknowledge that we all, can, we all can coexist. And you're right that, in fact, the more I think about this as time goes, the more I would like these AI systems to enable humans to actually coexist with themselves better than they do now, or at least improve their understanding of these complementarity of what they could. But it's too philosophical. I'm still solving the problem of getting them do something. But I think your question makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thank you.